Okay. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to people around the world. This is Mark Hubel, your host of the DB2 Night Show, and we are up to show number 254 for DB2 on Linux, Unix, and Windows. That's amazing. I've been doing this, I think, for about 12 years myself now. And uh, today we have our special guest is Phil Nelson, a good friend of mine, and uh, he works with Lloyds Bank and Scott DB, uh, as well as being an IBM champion. How are you doing today, Phil? <clears throat> I'm doing very well. I, I, as we were just talking about before the show started, spring is almost here in Scotland, even though it's still pushing four degrees, which is not too bad for this oh, time of year here. Yeah, 39 degrees, uh, but <clears throat> we've gone actually from uh, winter to summer in, in a matter of a couple of days. We are way up into the uh, low eight. Oh, we were nearly 90 degrees in Toronto yesterday, but uh, which is about 20. Uh, 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 29 degrees. It was just uh, un unbelievable. But, you know, things will cool down. You, if you don't like the weather, just wait a day or two and things will be back to something else. So, mm -hmm. with that in That's mind, right. let's move along and uh, we will uh, get the housekeeping out of the way so we can get to the good stuff. As always, uh, please follow us on Twitter with the hashtag of DB2Night. You'll get up, uh, up to dates things on when replays are available and when the next shows are coming along. The way I've been getting a reasonable audience for the show is actually to uh, post on Twitter as well as on uh, the list server for my duck. And if you follow one or both of those, you, you'll be aware of when the show is. I try to do that a couple of days before. And uh, replays uh, being on YouTube makes life a lot easier for people that don't like downloading. Uh, of course, one thing people always like to download is a handout and they're presenters have always been good about pre providing that to to us for you so with that in mind there's our disclaimer which is always always uh, we respect copyrights we record things and stuff like that so uh, moving on we will look at the next slide which is basically saying what's going on our upcoming shows next month on db2 luw we have uh, another good friend of the show dale mckinnis uh, from the IBM Toronto Lab, talking about a new thing that IBM is promoting called the Always On Architecture. And then on June 9th, we have machine learning, uh, the machine learning optimizer. That was brought out about two or three years ago, but when we asked if people were using it, we didn't get a big response in our, our show with John Hornibrook. So we've uh, asked Callisto to come back on and uh, present that again and give some updates on the functionality there. Also with uh, uh, DB2LUW, um, the machine learning optimizer, as I recall, is a part of the product. So it's not an extra charge option. And so you will want to uh, tune in to hear that show. On the ZOS side or ZOS, depending on what part of the world you're in, uh, we have Cheryl Larson coming back to present uh, uh, mistakes to avoid. And uh, that's uh, next week, actually. We have a, a kind of things lumped together based on uh, some events happening in the DB2 community. Uh, I'll be up over in Germany the following week, so I had to put things uh, closer together. Uh, May is uh, Dave Belke coming back to talk about DB2 Java performance. And then in, uh, in uh, June 16th, we have Sonia Kamaswaran of the IBM Silicon Valley Lab talking about the application development uh, um, uh, experience transformation strategy. Uh, Patrick Box Bossman used to present that, but uh, Sonia will now be doing that. Um, as always, uh, as, and forever really, uh, DBI Software has been the sponsor of the DB Tonight Show. And uh, uh, once again, you can watch their demo and get a, a Starbucks gift card, I think, if you watch that. Also, DBI now supports SQL Server as well with their tool set. Oops, I managed to misspell something. It wouldn't, that, that way you know it's actually me. I'm, I'm gonna, I should fix that, but it's, uh, I, I took my typing lessons from Julia Child and she reminded me that for safety, I sh should always wear oven mitts. That's why my typing is as special as it is. Brian Johnson of Vanguard 
is a gift certificate winner. Congratulations, Brian. I'm sure you've already received that. And our sponsors are yours truly, Martin Hubel and DBI Software. Now we've got some polls. As always, these are always fun to do. Let me uh, bring up the uh, first poll here, I'm launching it, and you should see that opening up. And please, uh, uh, I believe all of the polls today are uh, uh, choose as many as you need to. And we're getting the people voting on that. And with that in mind, we'll close that and share the results. Uh, good thing is 70% of our audience is on version uh, 11.5.6 or higher. That's great news. And then we have other things. And of course, when people are uh, lagging behind, it's not often their, it's sometimes not their fault or often it's not their fault because vendors have not certified the newer releases of DB2. Carrying on to the next, which operating systems you're on DB2 on. And uh, we've kind of put uh, uh, where uh, cloud-based uh, implementations in their own category on here, just to see how many people are embracing the cloud. With 82% of our audience having voted, this is rather telling, isn't it, Phil? It is. It's interesting. I think if, if I got to vote, I could have said DB2 Warehouse or Cloud, but well, it doesn't surprise me. Well, let's find a way to get you to vote then. Uh, never mind. <laughs> it will be quite all right. And that was 91% of our audience as well, so that... that uh, that unfortunately is uh, indic indicative sometimes of the uptake of these new and important features. And the other indic interesting thing from that, of course, was that AIX is now down to 50%. Yeah, people are moving towards Linux, that's true. I, I've had some big customers move from uh, AIX onto uh, the cheaper, hard uh, cheaper solutions of Linux, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not as easy as people think to do, but they, they do it. And uh, what types of UDFs have you written? and uh, pick the ones you like there. We're probably thinking about that a little bit, or which ones are available in your shop if you didn't personally write them. Yeah, I guess everybody uses Scalar UDS, because IBM supplies you hundreds of them, but... <laughs> yeah. But, and lots of table ones as well, but... Oh, indeed, we'll yeah. Indeed. All right. Well, a and if you don't know what they are, hopefully we'll know before the end. That's right. Yeah. If there's, there's a lot, I, unfortunately, I'm only allowed to have five answers. So there isn't a chance to say, what's a UDF? But uh, yeah. But anyway, we've got uh, people have voted there long enough that they're going to, and we'll share the results there. And scalar table row, source and aggregate are not yet voted so those are possibly an education opportunity maybe they've already written it and just don't realize it yet okay well, that's good all right so that takes us to the end of the polls let me hide that go back over here and we'll make you the presenter i did that earlier i'm sure i can do it again as always with this uh, you'll be uh presenting oops i got the wrong thing there and uh, attendees, that's the one I needed. We need to make you the presenter. As always, um, sorry, I'm still clicked on the wrong thing. These buttons, buttons everywhere. Make presenter, yes, I finally did it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so hopefully you will be able to see my screen now. We can see your screen and you're just, uh, and now you're in presentation mode, so ready to go. As always, I'll be uh, following the question uh, queue. Uh, people can write in questions using the question tool uh, and uh, at an appropriate break point, I'll, I'll break in and and, uh, and uh, ask you questions. So do we keep it a little uh, more active? In the meantime, I'll mute myself in case there's a very good looking dog outside that uh, Lacey and Lily need to bark at. So I'll be the only one to experience that. So please take it away. 
Well, thanks very much, Martin. So it's good to be back on the on the night show. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay because I have a I'm doing this from headset and I'm doing it with a Scottish accent. I think the Scottish accent might be worse than the headset to be honest. So this is a presentation I did at the back end of last year in sunny Edinburgh, my hometown, when we were able to visit a IDUG came to visit. He enjoyed doing it and a lot of people said they found it useful so we thought we'd bring it along to the night show and let people on the night show experience it who didn't make it to Edinburgh. If you want to come to an even nicer place in Edinburgh of course later in the year you can come to sunny Prague in October which is of course the next the most beautiful city in the world. So that's where this came from. What I typically do when I'm present when I'm putting some submissions in for IDUG is I often put in a topic that I want to know more about myself because if your presentation gets selected you really need to put the work in to uh, understand the topic because the other thing I would never do is present a topic that I was basically just picking up from the manuals. I would want to have experienced it myself and so it forces me if I get selected to actually get into a topic and have a deep dive into it. So that's where this came from. I have been writing UDFs on and off and what probably prompted it was that I was doing some work actually with Martin on a conversion from AS400 or onto DBTL UW and these people had quite a lot of UDFs including lots of table UDFs with some functionality I'd never seen and discovered that the same functionality actually worked in LUW so set myself a target of understanding. So I'm trying to move forward my, my screen now. Here we go. So we're going to start off by exploring these diff different types of UDFs and I, I was telling people in a training class yesterday that I DBAs and people like that like to use acronyms and not explain them. So UDF, user defined function. So we're going to look at the different types of UDFs that are possible and look at the syntax. And then we're going to focus quite a lot on table UDFs. And towards the end of the presentation, we'll actually be doing a comparison of using table UDFs with other alternatives for doing potentially the same job. Uh, two options in that space would be using stored procedures or using views to return essentially a tabular view of data that's been manipulated in some way or other from what's in your database. And one of the features we'll look at at the end is a feature called pipe, which is unique to UDFs and actually at the moment unique to LUW and the S400 is not on the ZOS. A, a lot of what we're going to talk about today you'll not you'll not find all the functionality available in db 2 for z platform unfortunately which is a real pity since some of the functionality I'm going to talk about is really really useful. So that's the plan is to go through UDF syntax but focus on particular features within table UDFs which I found useful and interesting. So UDF types, well the, I suppose the, the original UDF was the external UDF, the ability to write a function in some third party programming language and then expose it in the database as a function. So that's the original and we'll have a very quick word about that in a minute. And then we'll look at inline UDS which are the very simplest functions you can write and we'll look at both how to write one and also then talk a little bit about some of the limitations you have but also and just a two minute talk for ZOS specific people and the comparison with LUW why you might end up doing inline UDFs 
in ZOS particularly. Then the most of the of the topic is all talking about a SQL based UDFs UDFs written with the SQL PSM or SQL PL, whatever you, you call it, the procedural language. And we'll look at the different types, the scalar ones, row functions and table functions. And we'll also look for a minute or two at some very esoteric uh, UDF types. And it's not surprising when we did the survey that nobody had ever written one of these. Uh, I have written them, but not written them in anger, uh, for use in anger, because they are very, very specialised. But we'll talk briefly about them so that people know they're there, and if they ever need to use them, then they'll at least have a, a starter for 10 on how to go about it. Okay, so starting off in external UDFs. As we said, this is where you write the code in some third party language and the, num the range of languages still continues to grow for running these in LUW. So it started off, it was C or Java. Then you have a variety of options from the .NET world, a C++ and Python is the latest one to be added. So you can now write user-defined functions that are written in Python and then exposed inside your database. A, we're not going to say very much more about them, apart from when you define them, you have to give it a parameter style, and the parameter style is essentially a, dependent on the language you're using. So, for example, if you are writing a Python UDF, then you need to have a parameter style of NPS generic, but these are language dependent and there are rules for how you map between your uh, function parameters on your external functions uh, and, and external language functions and to SQL. Also rules about where you have to put the code so that it's available to the to DB2. So that's all we're going to say about external UDFs. What we're going to focus on now is UDFs written just as SQL definitions. So the simplest of these is the inline UDF. And this is a UDF where it's a single piece of code. There are no begin end options and no a extra semicolons found in the middle of the code. It's simply a create statement telling you the time that returns some options and a single SQL statement for the function body. So as an example of that, here is a, a simple UD, inline UDF. So what it does is it takes a input parameter of a character, a, a, an input parameter which is in a date format and returns it into in a format that is a character eight a in century century year year month month day date format and you can see that the piece in green is a single SQL expression there are no a full SQL there's no error handling parameters a, the other thing you'll notice is in the parameter that the default is in and therefore you don't need to say it's an input parameter. So that's a, a very simple UDF. Why on earth would you ever want to write such a thing when it, the amount of functionality you can use is limited? Well, there is a reason, and we'll come to that in a minute. But first, before we do that, we'll look at a totally identical UDF that allows you to use the full procedural language. So what you'll find is that for a simple scalar UDF, we've just taken the return statement and we've slapped begin and end round about it. But of course, inside that begin and end, you can have lots of SQL PSM code. So in terms of the two, is there really any difference? Well, there is when you dig in behind the scenes. So if you were to look at the catalog, 
you will find that for the a uh, the store the uh, UDF we just showed here, this one, you'll find that it actually has a field in the catalogue in Syscat Routines a uh, for implementation, which is that DVPVM PVM entry, and there's a value in the libid field, the libid column. Whereas if you look at the inline one that we showed you earlier, it's got a null in the implementation and the libid is minus one. And what that means is that for a, a SQL scalar function like this with the begin and end, DB2 will generate a package. That's what the libid is telling us. And whereas for the inline one, no package exists. Now, that certainly gives us a, a problem on a ZOS we discovered, a, and we wanted to evaluate what, whether it would give you the same problem on ZOS, on, on LUW. The problem is that if you've got a package, it's essentially a piece of static S, SQL that's been bound, and the code for this has to be loaded you know, into the package cache and it uh, will be unpacked by the database whenever it thinks it, it's done with it, for example. And when we, we had some very simple user-defined functions that were written essentially like this, but had some error handling to pick up a invalid data. In particular, we were taking character strings, basically doing the reverse of this, taking character strings and returning dates. And we had all sorts of error handling in place to check for a situation where the character string didn't actually contain something that we could turn into a date. And what we discovered is that the execution time for big extracts we were running, which were using lots of these functions, increased dramatically. And what we found was that when we raised a, a, a bug report was that it was because of the amount of time taken loading the packages. So when I started writing these for LUW, I thought, well, I need to check this out. And what we discovered was that there was actually not the same problem on LUW. We invoked a, a UDF of each type approximately 200,000 times and found that the CPU and elapsed time were similar. Of course, if you want to find out these things and and whether your, your reasoning is correct, then you go and speak to the experts on optimization. So I had a chat with John Hornibrook about this at one of the conferences. And he basically explained that they will do an awful lot of work as the LUW optimizer does to optimize these things and essentially will get very similar function, you know, very similar access paths, whether it's in line or not. So we didn't have to worry about having to write in line expressions for LUW, which was good because what we discovered when we went came to rewrite them for for ZOS into inline ones to try and save us some cycles was that it's actually really complicated to do all the things that are easy to do in standard procedure language but do it in <coughs> do it in a single SQL expression so essentially you're, you're going to have to put a probably a big case statement in there, which will test all the conditions and return strange things when you get error conditions. And it just gets very messy very quickly. The takeaway from this is if you're doing a fairly simple UDFs, scalar UDFs in LUW, write them as PSM ones because it just gives you so much flexibility in in what you can do. It allows you to put proper error handling in, which is always a good thing, and it makes the code much simpler to write. So that's a simple 
scalar UDF, of course, scalar being that for each set of input parameters, you're going to get a single value return. So essentially, you're generating a, a column a, within your result set using a scalar UDF. So here's an example of that. So we've got this UDF date to character, and we're feeding it in a date. And what it basically produces is a, a single column in our in our result set, which is as you would expect. So that's a scalar UDF. The row UDFs are, are a bit interesting. This is where your function takes a parameter and it returns a row of data. And they're a bit a they're probably very infrequently used. But you can see the syntax. It's here. It's you know, create function, give it a name. And what you'll notice is that the input parameter A is from a structured data type that we've defined. In this case, we've returned a structured data type for aircraft. And who knows me, knows I'm about an airplane buff. And what we ask it to return is a, set, a row of data, which is basically returning the various elements from that structured data type. So we're taking out two values, the type and the constructor's number, which are standard data types. And we can see that how we do that is we have this double dot syntax for referring to the various pieces within the structured data type. I don't think very many people use structured data types at all. So therefore, probably explains why very few people have written one of these. OK, so row UDFs. But where people will have, if not written, we at least will have used, are table UDFs. So when I say used, they'll have used them because IBM ships a lot of functionality in the database itself using table UDFs. A lot of the monitoring capabilities, for example, use table UDFs as outputs. These are things that people have used. Uh, what this does is it returns a table of data, and the invocation is basically select some columns from the keyword table, and then in brackets the, the UDF you want to call with the variables, the parameters you want to call it with, and then as X, for example, to define a correlation token that you can use with that table. And you can treat it just like any other table. And we're going to speak quite a bit more about UDFs, table UDFs, before we're done. So here's an example of creating a simple table UDF. So we're creating this UDF called UDF table data. We're taking a date parameter, and we're returning a table which contains three columns, a, all of them very well named column one, column two, and column three, and the SQL statement returns a select statement from a table. And that's probably the simplest type of UDF where you have a return and a select statement a, which returns the column you want by in that way. So that's a, a simple table UDF. A, just before we finish this first section, we'll look at a couple more esoteric things. First of these is what's called source UDFs. And this is where you want to define one UDF based on another UDF. And the kind of place where we would use this is if you want to take a UDF and make the functionality available for a different compatible input type. And you can do the casting between the input types. And probably the most typical use case is where you have defined a user-defined type and you want to use some of the standard functions. So here's an example of how you do that. So we've created a, our own user-defined type called money. It's based on the decimal line two, but we've called it money and said with comparisons. So we create a table called order which has got an order ID and a sale amount, and the sale amount we've defined is of type money. And then we insert a row, a couple of rows, a 
the first one is a hundred dollars and twenty five cents and the second one is ninety nine seventy five so that we can actually do a select sum of the sale amount from the order. Now if we think that's going to work and using the standard functions we will actually get an error as equal four forty a minus 440 and it will tell us something no authorized routine name sum of type function having compatible arguments was found and you think to yourself what on earth is going on here until you realize that a the problem is that you've got a a data type of money and this sum built-in function doesn't know what money is it needs to it's only able to work on the internal data types, but not on the one you've defined. So what you've got to do is create a source function, which maps the internal function sysibm.sum onto the a new function, which allows you to use the money. So here we're doing that. We're creating a function called sum, which is returning a of desk deck float and we're saying the source for this is the sysibm dot sum function for data type decimal nine comma two because that's where money came from and then if we run the select sum sale amount from order this will now work and give us a, a total of two hundred dollars so that's where source UDFs come into their own Similar to this are, are what are called function templates and mappings. And this is all about <coughs> federated systems. So where you have you know, a, a mapping between the current system you're on and some other system, and that system doesn't need to be DB2 LDW, it can be DB2 ZOS, or it can even be Oracle, SQL Server, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And you want to be able to make use of the functions that are available on both sides. Also, you might want to deal with a situation where there is a function available with the same name on both sides, and the, the optimizer will choose a, a, a method of doing the calculation based on which it deems less expensive, and you might want to turn it off so you only use the local function. So here's an example of this. So We've created a function. A, there's a function, say, called UDF car to date, and it actually exists a, on another platform. And we want to map a, so that we can use that function internally. So we've got this UDF, UDF car to date, in this case on our, our ZOS system. And we define this function template saying that we're going to use a function template. A, and we give it a name, and then we say create function mapping, and we say my ZOS car to date for the UDF car to date which car eight, and we say in this case that we've got a federated server called ZOS one, and we want to whenever we call this, we're actually going to a whenever we call UDF car to date, and we're talking to ZOS one, then we're going to call a remote function called car to date and use that. So it allows us to do the function mapping. And in this case, we're mapping it to a single location, to a server ZOS1. But you can also set these up so that they actually can be used at any location. So if we've deployed this car to date function in all our ZOS systems, and we want to say that no matter which a remote location we use, as long as its server type is db2zos, this mapping can be compatible as well. And we do that by instead of doing the server, we use server type in the keyboard. And then every zos remote location we're mapping to using using federation, it can use that, a, that function mapping. Okay, so that's one of the esoteric ones. The other esoteric one is aggregate functions. Now, of course, we know that DB2 supplies a whole bunch of aggregate functions for us to use. So sum and count and a average and min and max and other ones that I didn't can't even remember because I fell asleep during the statistics class. But 
if we don't like the ones that's there or we want something else that's an aggregate function, we can define our own. And what you've got to do is supply the various building blocks for the different stages of the aggregation. And the building blocks that you've got to supply are three store procedures and one user defined function before you actually get to define the aggregate function. And each of these four pieces you then sub specify in your creation of your aggregate function. So here we have the four keywords in red that define the pieces. So the first of these is initialize, which has only output parameters. And this is a store procedure that will actually initialize all your state variables. And the state variables have to match the state variables in the aggregate function a definition name. Then we have two functions that look quite similar in the, in the on the face of it, but they're slightly different. The accumulate one takes the input data as input parameters and has input parameters matching state variables. So that basically is the thing that does the increment. So when we, if we're doing a sum, it would be the thing that takes the current row values and adds together the two pieces you need, the value and the adds one to the count. The merge is, a, has in and out in and out parameters, both matching the state param state variables, and we it does a kind of similar job right at the end. And then there's a UDF called finalize, which does the final calculation. So maybe to make sense of this, I'll give you an example. So here we are creating the various parameters. So we're going to create our own mean function. And my mean initialize is the first procedure. And it takes has two output parameters and we set them up there and we set the values to zero, obviously, the sum and the count. And then the accumulate, which is at the bottom of the screen, takes an input to the deck, a deck float and it has two output parameters, the deck float and the, the, the count, so the sum and the count. And so what we're seeing here, uh, doing here is setting the sum equal to the sum plus the input. So that's the input being the value which comes from the uh, from the row we're currently working on. And the count is just going count plus one. Then we have a, the merge one. And you can see what it's doing is it's taking in the sum and count as input parameters and it's putting out a merge sum and a merge count. And you can see it's doing the, the merge sum equals sum plus merge sum and the merge count is count plus count sum, a merge count. And then last but not least, we have this function called finalize and it takes in the, the sum and the count and we tell it what to return. In this case, we're returning a deck float 34 and we return the sum divided by the count. Then to bring it all together, we define this function we're calling my mean, and you can see the four a, pieces in red are the four pieces we've just written, the three procedures and the one function. And the secret sauce to tell us that this is an aggregate function is this green aggregate and then the width, and these are the parameters you we specified. And you can see we've got sum and count, and these have to be the same names as the ones that are used in the the various procedures and functions below. And so what, trying this, so we've got a select average salary as a value and we get this. And this new function we've written, which is we've called my mean salary. And because we've defined the output as a deck float 34, we've actually managed to achieve another five levels of precision over the standard one, which is fine. Uh, but again, these are es esoteric. It's probably very few people will want to write their own uh, functions for aggregating data, but you never know. There might be budding statisticians out here and are really annoyed that some statistical function hasn't been yet delivered by IBM. So. 
there we go. Martin, I think I'll take a quick break there, and if you've got any questions, we can pick them up. Is that maybe a good yeah, idea? I've got one question here. Let me just pull it out. What is the difference between the out parameter and the return clause in a function? Or in other words, if a parameter is defined as out, how can it, how can it be used in the function? Okay, that's a very good question, which I would have to come back to somebody else. I've always used the return, but I think the the I've seen in out things, but I've never used them in anger. So um, better to be honest and not and declare. I don't know. Yes, I think so. But that is yep. a good question. Thanks, Peter. Sorry good about question. that. But um, one day we will know. <laughs> well, yeah, I shall. I shall look it up and maybe I shall update this presentation beforehand if you remind me to do that, and it'll be in the presentation once it's updated. Brilliant. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So moving on. A, we're going to focus for the rest of this on table UDFs. A, I'm just taking a note out versus return. Okay, give me two seconds. Okay, there we go. So moving on, comparing table UDFs. So as we know, as we saw before, table user functions allow us to return a table of data. And you can also do the same thing with a view. So basically, you can manipulate data from various tables in a view, and then somebody can read the view and see the manipulated data and all the complexity of the manipulation is hidden in the view. We can also do a very similar thing in store procedures by you know, declaring a cursor and then returning a cursor of data, which essentially returns a table of data. So we're going to look at the comparison. So the first thing we're going to do is compare a, the use of a table UDF versus the use of a view. So similarity, both are accessible from a regular select statement. So you can do select from table and a table UDF, or you can do select from and give it a view name, and you'll get a table of data back. The differences are, of course, that a views are limited to the single SQL expression. So in many ways, you have a lot of the same problems in a view as you would have if you were trying to write an inline UDF, like we mentioned before. E, if you're trying to do something really complicated, then that logic becomes very challenging to add, particularly, as we said before, that in a view, you basically have no ability to declare user-defined error handling. If you want to do error handling, you essentially have to do it by using case statements to return values you can then interpret as errors. And if you have any errors, DB2 is in control of these errors. So if you have some problem with the data that causes an error, DB2 will determine what to put back. You can catch that error and a handle it a different way. So views are much more limited in what you can do. And if you want to get complex in what you're doing, then views are a difficult to write for complex pieces. So UDF certainly would win out in most cases where you want to do complex logic. So tables, UDS versus, versus store procedures. So an awful lot more similarities here. So they both can return a result set of data, a, a single result set. A, you can have many SQL statements and you can have complex logic inside these, inside the, the definition. And even better, you can define your own error handling. So you can either define your own error codes and return name, or if you want, you can capture standard errors. So if there's errors that sometimes occur and you want to make them not errors but handle them in a very particular way, then you can do that. So error handling is a benefit that you can in, you have in both UDFs and store procedures. You're much more in control of the, the outcome. Of course, some things you cannot prevent, but you will get system error codes. You know, if the system goes down and you try to call a UDF, it's not going to get near the UDF. It's going to return an error saying 
you try to connect in the system unavailable, but once you get connected, you're much more in control. So some differences. So stored procedures can, of course, return multiple result sets. A, I think in all my days, I don't think I've actually seen, apart from people playing, have ever seen one that does return multiple result sets because they just, well, they, they're not supported by every language <clears throat> and people get confused about using them. So I personally have never written one, but if somebody does want to return multiple result sets, then stored procedures are you know, in the game in town, essentially. Another thing which is different and may have a significance, and it depends very much on your, a, your application environment, is that stored procedures use call statements rather than being able to be to use a select statement. And therefore it's using a different set of low level APIs to access the, the statement rather than using the functionality to use select. There's typically a different set of functionality that, that executes a call. And I've, unfortunately I've hit cases where some frameworks actually have never got round to supporting call. This is probably becoming less than it used to be, but the, in some cases it does become a problem that some frameworks only really understand you know, select, insert, update and delete. So therefore using a, a table UDF might be a better option in these circumstances. But the other thing is that we're going to go on to talk about is UDFs have some unique functionality. I probably should have mentioned another benefit that stored procedures have is that the, particularly on ZOS, stored procedures can be very easily turned into into REST APIs. It's not yet the case in LUW unless they've put it out since I last came about. You can there is some REST API capability, but it's not as advanced as the ZOS stuff by any manner of means. But certainly on our Z platforms, we do expose data from stored procedures inside by using stored procedures and, and making them into REST calls. So that's another. But of course, you can do a select statement, which you can expose as a REST call. So I suppose you can do the same with a table UDF if you so desire. But we're going to speak specifically now about a very particular unique feature within UDFs and unique to LUW and the I series boxes, not yet available as far as I can see on DB24Z. I will really wish it was. So we'll talk about that. It's quite interesting. So what we're looking at here is we have a a stored procedure or UDF and it has complex code, complex logic in it. And we may go down very different paths in our code as we process some data. And at the end of this, we want to send some of that data back to the calling process. Maybe, you know, there's lots of cases where you want to do fairly complicated stuff and you want to return a set of data. Now, of course, there are lots of cases where people have done that in stored procedures and in scalar functions, but being able to run tabular data in this situation, this is the typical methodology that people use. So the traditional one is using temporary tables. So you define a temporary table of some type or another. You define your cursor to read the temporary table as you're going through the logic, whenever you hit a column, uh, a set of data of items you want to return, you stuff that data as a row into the temp table. And then at the end of the, the procedure, you open the cursor and you turn it to the application. And having written quite a few of these in my life, a, there's a number of a, difficulties with this. Coding temporary tables and using temporary tables is I've always found a bit of a minefield, both at a execution time and also at definition time, because you always run into issues about does the temp table exist or does it not exist? 
for example, and you need to put in special handling for checking that type of condition. So that's the one of the issues. Uh, you end up doing an awful lot more coding than you would expect to do just to deal with the temp tables. Another thing which you discover is if your data that you want to return is large, you will very quickly run into into uh, outer log space issues. Uh, now you say, well, we could always define these temp tables as as in not logging, and well, that's fine if you're not in an HDR environment where you you, won't, you should really not be doing anything that's not logged. So uh, we always have the block non-logged uh, set by default. So that just isn't going to fly for us. So anyway, look, let's look at a, a and in fact. When you turn store procedures of this nature into table UDF, you'll find that it gets really challenging because trying to get data out of a cursor in, in, into a store into a UDF just gets a bit messy. And possibly they're telling us there is a better way you really should be doing it. And the better way is using a command that I was found in I series and was happy to find also works in LUW and that's called pipe. And literally when you want to output a data value, you just code pipe and the set of variables that you want to be piped out. And that becomes part of the output into the table UDF. A, no temporary tables, no cursors, none of that horrible coding that you've had to do, just pipe it and it will appear. Of course, the first thing that struck me as well, this is, might be easy, but what's the downside? So the first thing I thought was, well, does pipe have a performance problem? So I built some test code. I built some code to build and return the result set and test with increasing record counts to see how it got on. And Test one was store procedure using global temperature table. Test two, a table using UTF. You're also using a GTT. Very difficult, I found, to code. And test three was a table UDF using the pipe statement. And the results were interesting. First thing we notice, of course, is pipe is just so much easier to code. And really, to be honest, there wasn't real, an awful lot of difference in terms of the the time to run these. Sometimes we found in my testing the pipe was faster, sometimes the the store procedure was faster, but not really much. But the interesting thing was when we started cranking up the numbers. And even on my laptop, a very soon I started to find that table temp table use got real problems with log full issues. A, whereas with the pipe I was happily cranking up and it was over 50 million records returned without an issue. Obviously, who wants to return 50 million records, but it just shows that this thing really does cope with that scale. Of course, there's, there's always things that could be seen as an issue. First is that, the, and the other thing about the, the scale was I didn't really see any any issues with memory as well as it was doing this. So I'm not quite sure how it does it, but it's something really clever going on in there. Very pleased with the results. Of course, one thing you can do if you're doing a, a cursor return from a store procedure is inside the cursor, you can put an order by clause so your data comes out in order. And I thought to myself, well, that's a problem because you can't do that. Your pipe is just you pipe them in the order you want, and that's the order they appear in the output. And I thought that's a problem, but it actually isn't a problem because of course if you're selecting from a table a function, you can put an order by clause in that select and you can do ordering if you want. But actually it's really useful because the order you pipe it is the order you get data back. And if you don't code it, you get it back in that order. And therefore it's really useful for using reports. If you want reports to be written in a very specific order, as long as you pipe them in that order, then that's the order it's going to come out in, as far as I can see. In fact, 
it may be that's why some of the more esoteric reports that IBM has written are using table functions and probably using pipe internally because these reports, when you pipe them, they're guaranteed to come out in that order, which is good. So that's a pipe statement. If you've not came across it, and I was surprised that, well, shall we say I wasn't particularly surprised because I hadn't came across it until I started working the I-series, but it's a really useful feature, hopefully will help somebody. And that is me just about ready to wrap up. I think there's four minutes to the end of the a, official time. Any more questions, Martin? Um, just looking here, just looking. No, I think that was the, uh, Peter's question was the only one we had. So That's fine. That was good. Off the, very, off the hook. Useful, very useful information. Very good job. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to fill in your IDUG session evaluation since that would be really difficult to do. Well, actually, you can but, do it because we do have a, a survey after the fact. But, uh, okay, that's fine. What I'm going to do, so with, I'll let, what I'll I'll let do you instead is uh, go back to showing my screen and do the okay. uh, wrap up screen, but I'll also ask our final polling question, which is uh, always uh, a good one to, to do, which is Did you learn anything today? It's a pretty simple question and uh, it gets us a good answer on that. And people are voting quickly because it is lunchtime. So we'll close that off and share the results. And once again, we have a winner on the DB2 Night Show. We've got 100% of our audience learned something from what you presented today, Bill. And that's, that's absolutely good. great news. Good. That's what we're there for. That's what we are indeed here for. We are here to help and uh, let people learn new things. So that's just wonderful. So uh, as I always do, I'd like to thank you several, several times for the, the work you put in on the presentation and taking the time to share it with our, uh, with our community, our studio audience, of course, and the other people that will hear the show later. So uh, once again, thanks. I'm gonna cue our, our uh, music here and uh, Again, continue to thank you and wishing everybody a good, great weekend and stuff as the music plays. And we all take off and, and uh, get on with, get with our days and our weekends. So thanks again. Thanks everyone for attending. And we'll see you next week for a DB2Z show on, uh, on the DB2, DB2 Night Show. Take care all. Thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>